Good evening. I'm Dr. Angela Sanander, a professor in the theology department, and I'm directing the Institute for Catholicism and Citizenship at the University of St. Thomas. This institute, inspired by the Second Vatican Council, promotes civil discourse, faithful citizenship, and the common good by fostering theological insight and interdisciplinary inquiry into economic, political, and justice issues. I want to welcome back those who are participating in our symposium on the common good, which is co-sponsored by the College of Arts and Sciences, and welcome those who are joining us for this lecture tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Julie Sullivan, who came to us from San Diego, like our speaker tonight. Dr. Sullivan is in her third year as president of St. Thomas and has been a business professor or higher education administrator for more than 30 years. Her previous experience includes service as executive vice president and provost at the University of San Diego and professor and administrator at the University of California, San Diego and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is a native of Florida with three degrees from the University of Florida. In light of the theme of this symposium, I would like to highlight the emphasis that Dr. Sullivan places on the purpose of a St. Thomas education, which is all for the common good. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Julie Sullivan. Thank you, Angela. And uh, excuse my voice, I'm actually much better than I was yesterday and the day before and several days before that. So, uh, but good evening. Uh, I join with Angela in welcoming you to the University of St. Thomas for the two-day symposium and this evening's lecture. And it really is my privilege to introduce the most reverend Robert McElroy, Bishop of the Diocese of San Diego. As it turns out, as Angela said, we do have some things in common. We have run across each other before. Uh, I did leave San Diego in 2013. I was employed at the University of San Diego, and he didn't come to be the bishop of the diocese there until 2015. But as it turned out, I tried to get him to San Diego along with the president I was working with at the University of San Diego well before the Catholic Church did. Uh, we weren't as successful, however. We tried to hire Bishop McElroy to be the founding dean of the Joan Croc School of Peace Studies at the University of San Diego around 2006 or so. And um, I'm glad he finally ended up at San Diego. I'm sorry we didn't have the chance to work together, however. Uh, I also am probably the person in the room that last heard him speak because I was in San Diego for Easter and my husband and I attended Holy Thursday Mass at St. Joseph Cathedral for the purpose of being there because Bishop McElroy was celebrating and uh, it was a lovely, lovely Mass. I was just telling him I've already invited someone in San Diego to go, to go with us next year. Uh, she's a, a very active Catholic in that community. So it really is special for me to be here. I can tell you I, it will be a wonderful talk, and I'm really pleased to join you. Uh, and as Angela said, the, the topic of the talk, Catholics and the Common Good, the growing ends of the argument, is quite intriguing to me. It's certainly a topic that's very important to me personally, but even more importantly, it is the essence of the University of St. Thomas. As you know, the uh, last four words of our mission statement are advancing the common good. And so it befitting that as we've just come out with our new brand message, it is all for the common good. So I just came back from uh, several days of alumni visits and talking about our new brand and showing the brand statement video and explaining why our you know, our, basically our brand statement, our promise to the world is to be all for the common good. So I hope I got it right. I'm going to find out tonight. So <laughs> it's my opportunity to take some notes and have some more uh, material for my upcoming alumni visits. But Bishop McElroy is a native of San Francisco. He earned a bachelor's degree in American history from Harvard and a master's degree in American history from Stanford before entering St. Patrick's Seminary in Menlo Park, California. He also holds a licentiate in theology from the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley, a doctoral in moral theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, and a doctorate in political science from Stanford. Now, I went to school a long time, 
But that is that's far longer than I did. That's, that's quite impressive. He was ordained to the priesthood for the San Francisco Archdiocese on April 12, 1980, and will soon celebrate his 36th anniversary as a priest. I believe it's coming up this week. His assignments have included service as secretary to San Francisco Archbishop John Quinn, another one of our outstanding archbishops, vicar general of the Archdiocese and pastor of St. Gregory's in San Mateo for 15 years. Pope Benedict XVI appointed him auxiliary bishop for San Francisco in 2010. And thank goodness Pope Francis named him the sixth bishop of San Diego on March 3, 2015 and his installation took place one year ago next Friday. Bishop McElroy is the author of two books. One, The Search for an American Public Theology, and two, Morality and American Foreign Policy. And he has written a series of articles in America Magazine on the key elements of Catholic social teaching. So please join me in a warm welcome for Bishop Robert McElroy. Thank you. I give my thanks <clears throat> to Dr. Sullivan, and it's great to see her once again. Um, I had my arm twisted by her some years ago, and she twists really hard. <laughs> Ask Father Snyder. Ask Father Snyder. Yes, you know that. So but it's great to be here again, and great to be in this historic place. Now, could you hear me OK? OK. Um, it's wonderful to be here tonight. And uh, uh, when uh, I was asked to be here, I said yes. And to a great degree, it was because of the role this university has played for so many years as a real beacon in the light of the church in the United States. And so I'm grateful for that continuing tradition of Catholic scholarship and Catholic dedication to university life, which the University of St. Thomas represents, and its commitment to the common good. I have to say, I mentioned to, to uh, Angela beforehand that when I was looking out of the other room, I saw that your motto on the field <coughs> is pride and passion that are two deadly sins, so I was glad you've changed your brand. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it's now for the common good, you know. <laughs> and tonight I wanted to talk on the common good and the American political conversation at this moment. Um, and specifically a term that John Courtney Murray used called the growing end of the argument. As we gather at this historic university, which has contributed so richly to the reflection on the role of the common good in American society, we cannot but confront the brokenness of the American political conversation which has engulfed us in these past weeks. That brokenness is not confined to one candidate or to one party. It is not the product of a momentary lapse in American political life, but represents the onrushing tide of moral and political currents which have been present in American political life for the whole of this new millennium. The political life of our nation is in profound need of sustained and deep renewal. And in keeping with today's theme, Part of that renewal lies in comprehending the richness of the common good as it presents itself to contemporary America. John Courtney Murray, a Jesuit who is perhaps the greatest Catholic theologian which the United States has ever produced, sought a continuous intersection between the Catholic tradition of the common good and the American political conversation, which he termed the growing end of the argument. In every age, he wrote, the political life of the United States had to renew its moral and spiritual vision by reengaging deeply with the theology of the common good. It is intriguing to imagine how Murray, so dedicated to the proposition that American destiny lay precisely in its ability to remain embedded in the great tradition of deep moral reflection, would evaluate the current state of the American political conversation. But it is not hard to imagine his prescription 
for healing our political discourse. Reflect upon the deepest elements of that tradition of the common good and find their true direction and healing for our nation. Such a reflection points, I think, to three essential conversions in the American political conversation at this moment in its history. A conversion from a politics of divisiveness to a politics of solidarity. A conversion from party structures which bisect the common good to a politics which embraces the unity of the common good. And a conversion from seeking American dominance in the international order to an America which seeks to advance the international common good. And I'm going to speak to each of these three in turn. A conversion to solidarity. The most element, perilous element of our national political conversation today, I believe, is that the theme of solidarity is almost totally absent from it. Solidarity in Catholic teaching is the fundamental understanding that we are all bound together in God's grace in society. And that in the words of the compendium of the social doctrine of the church, the men and women of our day must cultivate a greater sense of awareness that they are debtors of the society of which they have become a part. Solidarity is a rejection of the tribal elements of politics, which see voting as the opportunity to advance the well-being of our race, our class, our religious community at the expense of others. Solidarity casts aside the exaggerated sense of entitlement, which so often breeds anger and division. Solidarity cultivates a recognition that every member of society and every group constitutes a vital part of the American social fabric, and that the identity of the American Republican people is constantly renewing itself, not by a rejection of new elements of our culture, nationalities, and faith, but by their integration into the common wheel in the light of the principles of the American tradition. Solidarity in Catholic teaching involves a willingness to sacrifice for the common good. In the words of St. John Paul II in Solicitudo Re Socialis, it is the recognition that we are bound, quote, to the good of one's neighbor, with the readiness in the gospel sense to lose oneself for the sake of the other rather than exploiting them. The founders of our nation believed that this sense of solidarity was essential to the existence of the republic which they were founding. It's easy for us to think when this country was founded that it was a foregone conclusion that democracy would succeed. But the founders didn't believe that. After all, there had been no democratic republic, at least since the Roman Republic. And thus, they knew it was a parable, perilous journey they were embarking upon. And they believed that this new experiment in democracy would only succeed if the citizens of the nation would be willing to put their own personal interests at times second to the good of the new nation. The founders called it civic virtue. And they were convinced that it was the only possible antidote to the dominance of self-interested politics and parties in the life of the new nation. Solidarity is a term which was implanted in Catholic social teaching by John Paul II. But the Christian principle which this term describes is an older one in Catholic social teaching. Pope Leo XIII called it social friendship. Pius XI termed it social charity, which should be at the heart of culture and society. Paul VI labeled it the civilization of love. At its core, this concept proclaims that in a society we bear a tremendous responsibility for the well-being of all men and women that we share with the society with. The compendium of Catholic social teaching makes clear that solidarity is Quote, not a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortune of many people, both near and far. On the contrary, it is a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself 
to the good of all and each individual because we are really responsible in a profound sense for all. The principle of solidarity must be placed at the heart of our political dialogue, not banished to the margins or reduced to a vacuous slogan which has no substance <clears throat> and requires no virtue. For the issue of solidarity is nothing more or less <coughs> than the type of what kind of society we are to be and we as Americans aspire to be at this moment in our history. That is why the questions of undocumented refugees, religious minorities, safety in the face of renewed terrorism in the world, torture, freedom, race, class, and xenophobia are so pivotal in the events unfolding within our nation at this moment because they touch directly upon the most neuralgic elements of what it means for us to be a people. <clears throat> One essential element of the conversion to solidarity in our national political conversation lies in the area of language. Too much of our political dialogue is not dialogue at all, but the purposeful use of language for division and castigation. There is a distinction between campaigning and governing. But when campaigning erects and deepens divisions in society enduring, in enduring ways, it ceases to be legitimate campaigning and needs to be labeled for what it is, an assault upon the solidarity and social fabric of our nation. Such campaigning poisons the culture of the republic and makes constructive efforts to address legitimate politics and political objectives virtually impossible when the campaigning is over and the process of governing begins. One example of this divisiveness can be seen in the war of slogans over racial injustice in the criminal justice system of our nation. The slogans Black Lives Matter was designed to point, point to the unacceptable moral reality that all too many African American men and women, and especially young men, are subjected to invidious discrimination in our criminal justice system. The counterargument was made that injustice in the criminal justice system of the United States is not confined to black men and women, and that all injustice should be a matter of moral concern. This is true. But the slogan that was used to convey this truth, all lives matter, was deliberately designed and utilized to minimize and delegitimize the original complaint against anti-black discrimination in our penal system. In this way, language has the power to corrode solidarity within society. And our national political conversation at this moment is more devoted to corroding solidarity with the politics of division rather than building the bonds of solidarity. Kathleen Caveney has addressed this issue of language skillfully in her new book, Prophecy Without Contempt. Caveney seeks to vindicate the use of powerful, assertive moral language and symbols in political discourse, while avoiding the corrosive divisive effects which prophetic and other affectively laden language can produce. She seeks to go beyond the civility which Stephen Carter has sought in American discourse and to unleash the power of symbolic language while maintaining social cohesion. The core of her approach resides in a willingness to explicitly reject the tone and politics of contempt in political conversation. One of the principal ways she proposes for doing this lies in the sense of humility reflected in the proclamation of the prophets of Israel against their own nation. These proclamations contain within them a fundamental theme that the prophets themselves were also guilty of the sins of Israel. Thus the prophets called to reform, not with a sense of contempt, however, for the people who need to be reformed, because they counted themselves among them. This stance was fundamentally one of solidarity, even as it was a stance of profound critique. 
It strikes me that as a minimum, we must seek a political conversation without contempt for those who oppose our positions. We must banish the increasing tendency in our society and in our media to label all those who disagree with us either arrogant, ignorant, or dishonest. We must reject the politics which presents the divides over issues as signs of moral defects among our opponents. For if we do not, it will be increasingly difficult in our society to build structures and patterns of national solidarity. It will be impossible to establish an American culture in which men and women find a unity to the ideals that bind them. And it will be harder and harder to bring to every succeeding generation the truth that all of us should feel as debtors in God's grace to the society of which we are a part. The second conversion, that to the unity of the common good. A second conversion rooted in Catholic social teaching which can ennoble our current national political conversation is the evolution of partisan political platforms to reflect rather than bifurcate the common good of society. The concept of the common good lies at the very heart of Catholic social teaching. It is anchored in an unswerving commitment to the transcendent dignity of the human person, the protection of human life, an abiding care for the poor and the marginalized, the protection of authentic freedom, and the promotion of peace. The political common good of a nation embraces those elements of life in society that properly fall to the work of government. It is dynamic, rooted both in constant principles of moral teaching, but also in changing social structure, laws, socioeconomic challenges, and historical events. It is the responsibility of every age for citizens to comprehend the common good that has emerged in the world in which they live. In his address to the bishops of the United States, Pope Francis outlined the major issues that constitute the political common good in our nation today. I encourage you then, my brothers, to confront the issues of our time. Ever present within them is life as good as gift and responsibility. The future freedom and dignity of our societies depends on how we face these challenges. The innocent victim of abortion, children who die of hunger or from bombings, immigrants who drown in the search for a better tomorrow, the elderly or the sick who are considered a burden, the victims of terrorism, war, violence, and drug trafficking, the environment devastated by man's predatory relationship with nature, the family. These are the elements that form the, the current moral common good that voters must weigh as they seek to approach their civic responsibilities. Hauntingly, Pope Francis advances these claims not as abstractions, but with the human face of the victims who suffer concretely from the failure of our society to advance specific dimensions of the common good. As citizens, we must maintain a focus in our political discernment and action on those very human faces, setting them before us, so as to inoculate ourselves against the powerful tendency in our culture to minimize the power of any of these moral claims upon our consciences. The specification of the common good in American society in this way presents a social fabric woven from an unswerving commitment to human dignity and the elimination of human degradation and marginalization. It demonstrates a unity which arises from the conviction that every assault on human dignity is a wound to the common good and to the understanding that social structures which undermine our human dignity are linked together in their causes, their manifestations, and their results. The commitment to the unity of the common good constitutes an essential element of what might be called the Catholic political imagination that focuses upon the connections among the various human degradations in society. Specifically, the Catholic understanding of the common good points to the causal linkages which underline various assaults upon the common good and human rights. Poverty is both a cause 
and a consequence of failing family structure. Crime is both a cause and a consequence of racial injustice. Economic decay is both a cause and a consequence of educational deprivation. It is precisely these linkages in the unity of the common good which is under assault by the per current configuration of our major political parties today. Our current party systems bifurcate the common good in their policy stances and prescriptions. The Republican Party speaks to questions of abortion, euthanasia, religious liberty, and elements of the moral identity of family life, but is tone deaf to the sufferings of the poor, to restorative justice, the daily traumas of life for the undocumented, and the peril of our global environment. The Democratic Party advocates policy initiatives to address poverty, immigration, justice reform, and environmental threats, but refuses to acknowledge the rights of the unborn, frequently discards the rights of religious communities, and is increasingly reluctant to advance measures to strengthen family structure in our nation. It is not just that each of the party structures jettisons enormous sections of the common good in formulating their policy proposals. Even more destructively, the parties label the efforts of their opponents to attain key elements of the national common good as destructive to society. Thus, Republican support for the unborn is cast as part of a war on women, and the defense of religious liberty is condemned as a mere cover for invidious discrimination. Similarly, democratic efforts to achieve comprehensive immigration reform, restorative justice, and economic advances for the poor are portrayed as undermining American safety, security, and economic health. The damaging effects of this bifurcation of the common good by our current party structures are deepened by the breadth and depth of the partisan divide in the United States. The contributions of moderates to both parties who acted as bridges across the partisan divides, both in their policy voting and in their contribution to the public debate, have all but disappeared in today's congressional life. And the growing tendency of Americans to seek their news from partisan sources increases the political divide, further undermining the possibilities of foregoing a national political vision, of forging a national political vision, which springs from and sustains the broad Catholic notion of the political common good. Historically, political parties have made enormous contributions to life in the United States. In the most important crises in our nation's history, political party structures have transformed and advanced the common good in profound ways. In 1860, the Republican Party of free soil, free labor, and free men cobbled together the coalition that elected Abraham Lincoln and forced America to confront the continuation of slavery, that original sin of the American Constitution. And in the wake of the Great Depression, the Democratic Coalition transformed the nature of the federal government in order to erect a social safety net that reached out to every corner of the land with jobs and food and electricity. In this election year, we stand in a moment of partisan ferment and perhaps of restructuring and renewal. This ferment is deepened by the reality that the largest single group of voters in today's America belongs to neither political party, but to the group of independents who have chosen to forsake their party structures because of their dissatisfaction with the options the parties current offer, currently offer to them. It is a major responsibility of the Catholic community to utilize this period of ferment and change to reinsert a broadened understanding of the comprehensive good into political debate, partisan structures, and political action. We must point unswervingly to the complex linkages among issues which parties now place into separate boxes for partisan gain. We must press for political structures which increasingly reward the breadth of political coalitions rather than their ability to rely primarily upon their most radicalized bases. We must advance an identity politics that points more to the unity of the human family 
rather than to wedge coalitions which divide that family. The notion of the common good, which has such deep roots in our national historical tradition, can provide the crucial compass for such a renewal and reconfiguration. America and the international common good. The United States still constitutes the most powerful economic and military actor in the world. American foreign policy decisions have immense global impacts upon people of virtually every nation. Yet the presidential election campaign has pointed vividly to the absence of a moral and politically informed foundation for the international relations of the United States. Themes ranging from America first, to American exceptionalism, to a vague internationalism, to outright isolationism have drifted through the political conversation, but not a single candidate has articulated a moral framework for pursuing U.S. policy goals in the coming year. In an age witnessing increasing terrorist threats, economic challenges to America's well-being, and the continuing war in Afghanistan, which remains the longest major war in American history and shows no sign of ending, the American political conversation must confront the moral assumptions that underline our current foreign policy. The Catholic tradition of the common good provides the best framework for doing so. In his first trip outside of Rome after his election, Pope Francis traveled to the tiny Sicilian island of Lampedusa, Lampedusa where hundreds of immigrants have been shipwrecked seeking freedom in a new life in Europe. He threw a wreath into the ocean in their memory, and then he spoke to the world, a piercing challenge about the deepest ties which bind us in our humanity and about the global culture of indifference which insulates us from facing the core question of solidarity amongst suffering, inequality, and self-interest. Echoing the words of the book of Genesis in the story of Cain and Abel, Pope Francis declared, God asks each of us, where is the blood of your brother who has been killed here, shipwrecked in this place? Where is the blood of your brother that cries out to me? Today, no one in the world feels responsible for this for we have lost the sense of fraternal responsibility. Who is my brother and who is my sister in a globalized world? For Catholic faith, the answer to this searing question that Pope Francis posed at Lampedusa is rooted powerfully in the conviction that there has emerged a distinct international common good which is binding and unites all of the peoples of the world in ties of moral responsibility. In a very real way, Catholic teaching on the common good was first fully presented by Pope John XXIII in Pacham and Terrace, emphasizing that the modern world faced enormous interwoven problems and challenges that were of their nature beyond the ability of any state to meet. St. John declared that a true international common good did indeed exist and that it had a moral identity as profound as the moral identity or the common good of the nation state or any subsidiary element of society. Pacham and Terrace listed a series of challenges to peace and justice that pertain directly to the entire human family and that necessarily formed essential elements to address through the pursuit of a truly global common good. But for Catholic teaching, the primary question was not whether or not globalization was forming new webs which bound peoples more tightly together. The question was for the church decidedly a moral one. As Pope Benedict lamented powerfully in his cyclical Caritas and Veritati, quote, as society becomes ever more globalized, it makes us neighbors, but it does not make us brothers. The question of the identity and nature of the universal common good is quintessentially a moral question. What are the central bonds of brotherhood and sisterhood which the empirical reality of globalization 
thrusts upon all of us as members of the human family. The starting point for identifying this moral reality of the international common good lies in the pivotal affirmations of our faith. God is the father of the entire human family. The creation is a gift to every woman and man. That the stewardship of our planet belongs by right to all and that war is a massive failure of the entire human family. The realization that there is a true international common good comes from understanding that some of the most profound human problems that touch upon these affirmations of faith in humanity lie far beyond the ability of any nation or small group of nations to address justly and effectively in a globalized society. It is in addressing these very issues that the moral nature of politics, which Pope Francis outlined in his speech to Congress, must come into play. Quote, politics is an expression of our compelling need to live as one. In order to build as one the greatest common good, that of a community which sacrifices particular interests in order to share in justice and peace its goods, its interests, its social life. It is this realization that Pope Francis has been calling us to in these past three years. As he has proposed, proposed forcefully to our global conscience <clears throat> that the issues of dire poverty and economic justice, safeguarding the environment, the protection of refugees, and the building of a peaceful world contribute not merely to areas where the failures and limitations of the nation state generate often severe problems, but also, and more importantly, they comprise fulcral elements of a truly international common good, which forms a claim upon and an end for the newly emerging international community which globalization has forged. In short, the identification of an international common good is a moral enterprise which demands that the human community locate, institutionalize, and pursue the steps that will make us brothers and sisters, rather than merely often competing neighbors in a world that globalization is creating the international economy. In 2014, Pope Francis and the Political Council on Justice and Peace brought together leading experts of finance, business, trade, and economics to discuss a central theme which the Pope has raised unceasingly in his pontificate, how to make the world economy more inclusive so that the economic forces which now exclude more men and women from meaningful participation in economic life are reversed. The title for this gathering was illuminative of France's entire approach to the question of poverty and economic life, a seminar on the global common good. <clears throat> in his address to participants at the seminar, the Holy Father emphasized that all economic questions are in the end questions of serving the human community, stating, that if the human person is not at the center, then something else gets put there, which the human being then has to serve. In its deliberation, its participation, the participants in the seminar on the global good recognize the benefits of globalization and existing market structures, but they recognize an even more fundamental need in the world community to recover our moral compass and re-examine the assumption of our economic theory to be more realistic and based on a more complete view of the human being and of the world. The group called for global acceptance of a series of structural changes in economic life, including the adoption of ambitious and inclusive sustainable development goals that centered on human dignity, the design of an eth ethical framework which guides the actions of the G20 nations, structural nation changes to empower the poor and the invulnerable, to achieve meaningful inclusion in financial life and the access to credit, and a campaign to combat persistent structural unemployment and particularly growing youth unemployment in certain sectors of the globe. With the eye of a prophet, Pope Francis poses the patterns of globalization in the economy 
and sees a relentless process of exclusion. He said to the UN, in effect, a selfish and boundless thirst for power and material, material prosperity leads both to the misuse of available natural resources and the exclusion of the weak and the disadvantaged. Economic and social exclusion is a complete denial of human fraternity and a grave offense against human rights and the environment. In this vision of economic life, which Pope Francis how powerfully presented to the world, grotesque levels of inequality, unemployment, dire poverty, and malnutrition constitute the wholesale violation of core elements of an authentic and substantive global common good. The environment. Catholic theology is powerfully rooted in enduring understanding that the entire created order is a gift from God entrusted to the whole of humanity for safekeeping and stewardship. The protection of the environment in the modern world is uniquely vulnerable to risks that lie beyond the borders of any nation to contain. Thus, it is no surprise that the Church identifies the care of the environment as one of the central elements of the international common good that is the responsibility and heritage of every member of the human family. Pope Benedict has often been called the Green Pope because he so dramatically and consistently elevated the discussion of the environment within both ecclesial and global discourse. For him, the nature of environmental biodegradation was so inherently a global phenomenon that it could no longer adequately be addressed by any local or even national set of policies. Quote, we are all responsible for the protection and care of the environment. This responsibility knows now boundaries. In accordance with the principle of subsidiarity, it is important for everyone to be committed to his or her proper level to working to overcome the prevalence of particular interests. In his encyclical Laudato Si, Pope Francis took up this theme in delineating an emerging theology of the environment, which links care for the world of nature and care for human development as correlative elements of a global common good. The first element of this delineation lies in recognizing the peril which the world faces on environmental issues at this moment in human history. The technological desire to dominate the earth has led to increasing crises in areas of climate change, water, resources, and biodiversity. The Pope concludes, We'd only, we need only take a frank look at the facts to see that our common home is falling into serious disrepair. Hope would have us recognize that there is always way out, that we can always redirect our steps, that we can always do something to solve our problems. Still, we can see signs that things are now reaching a breaking point due to the rapid pace of change and degradation. The world system is certainly unsustainable. The way out of this trajectory of the increasing degradation of our earthly home lies in approaching the central issues of the environment through a systematically international lens. An interdependent world not only makes us more conscious of the negative effects of certain lifestyles and models of production and consumption which affect us all. More importantly, it motivates us to ensure that solutions are proposed from a global perspective and not simply to defend the interests of a few countries. The issue of the environment provides to us one of the most warped elements of the current American political conversation. The denial of climate change which is rampant within the culture of the United States, and distinctively so, is a reflection both of the power of moneyed interest to shape the American political conversation and what Richard Hofstadter called 50 years ago the paranoid strain in American politics. In perhaps no other sector of American public life can the witness of Catholic social teaching shine more, with more penetrating force and importance so that the world's most powerful nation might take up the ethical challenge that is pivotal for the survival of our species. 
War and Peace. War is the ultimate denial of the universal common good. At the same time, it is perhaps the most intractable challenge to grapple with in attaining the common good. We live in an age when technological advancements have made the destructiveness of war immensely greater, yet our capacity to reduce and contain war has not appreciably advanced. Catholic teaching has now come to a point of profound suspicion about the moral legitimacy of any recourse to war. Yet cultural, political, economic, and religious rivalries are continually igniting both conflicts within and among human societies. Only a degree of institutionalized constraints on warfare, which is difficult to envision realistically today, could create a world in which war is a rarity. Still, there are three identifiable and attainable elements of the universal common good that could be appreciably limit the frequency and cost of warfare in the future through collective action. The first of these elements is the containment of nuclear weapons and all weapons of mass destruction. In the period marking the end of the Cold War, the US and the Soviet Union substantially reduced their nuclear arsenals and in this way contributed to a more peaceful world. But we no longer live in a world where nations will be content to watch a few major powers having large nuclear arsenals and newly belligerent small powers are allowed to establish net nuclear arsenals to terrorize their neighbors. The world has squandered the opportunities which the last 20 years have provided to us for addressing the threat of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. It is against this backdrop that Pope Benedict called in 2008 for a radical and universal commitment to limiting nuclear weapons in the world. And after that call, leaders from many of the nuclear countries in the world have taken positions far stronger than was thought possible to embark upon this road. One of the most important witnesses that the Catholic community make, can make in this period of time to the common good is to undertake these efforts and to support them in the coming years to make sure that we as a world move toward a time when nuclear weapons and the deterrence and the threat of nuclear terrorism is lessened appreciably by our all acting together. A second area touching upon the issue of war and peace in the global framework is the international and systematic market in armaments. The Second Vatican Council 50 years ago pointed to the reality of theft from the poor, which has only become more profound in the intervening years. As long as armaments and extravagant sums of money are poured into the developments of new weapons, it is impossible to devote adequate aid to tackling the misery which prevails in the present day in the world. Therefore, we declare once again, the arms race is one of the greatest curses of the human race, and the arm and inflict, harm it inflicts on the poor is more that can be endured. The final element of the universal common good which touches upon war and peace is the erection of an effective global network for the protection care and relocation of the victims of war. We live in an age when vast networks of transportation exist to move refugees to safer ground, where vast resources of food and education and housing can be made available to alleviate the horrendous suffering which we've been witnessing in Europe and the Middle East during these past months. Legitimate fears of terrorist activity demand careful steps to guard the safety of societies offering care to refugees. Yet exaggerated fears of national interests in myopia have so often compounded the suffering of the refugee and prevented substantive action. The emergence of the nation state gave rise to a system of national identities which classified individuals and their rights according to their nationality in the global age. In our current day, there must be a new system which provides protection to the refugees of war and violence and oppression based not upon their national identities but upon their global citizenship as children of the one God 
who is the father of us all. Our national politics is broken at this moment. In three important ways, the call to solidarity, the conversion of political structures to the common good, and the embrace of the international common good, Catholic social teaching can provide an illuminating and ennobling correction to our national politics, our political dialogue, and to our culture. Let us pray as Pope Francis did in his address to Congress, that we as a people might be more deeply guided by the thirst for freedom embodied by Lincoln, the dedication to human dignity embodied by King, the search for justice reflected in the life of Dorothy Day, and the spiritual depth symbolized by Thomas Merton. Thank you very much. And in part, that's true of all of our life. That is, uh, as Catholics, we we're called to live out our faith. And as individuals in the community, we, we do well in some areas and we fail in some areas. The, co the common good, though, is, is a way of thinking about things which follows in our national tradition and is common to our faith. It's, it's a way of dialogue with people. And it basically is that call that says we're called to look upon our own national self-interest. You know, in, in American politics, so much of pluralism emphasized groups competing against each other for out of their own interest. The common good takes a different perspective. It's not that pluralism's wrong, but that, that the common good strives to say, uh, what do we as a nation seek to achieve? What kind of a society do we want to be? Knowing that we're gonna fall short of that knowing that at no time in its history has our country lived up to its ideals. So what, what my urging is that the Catholic community look to our theology of the common good and our faith about the common good and try to talk within the wider society about this because it's not that it's specifically a Catholic teaching. These, these, these sets of values I've been talking about will go well beyond the church or Catholic community. But the fact that we're in our political conversation and there, there has been almost no talk about what we want to be as a people, you know, other than winners. Um, uh, uh, and then, then that, that's important, what we want to be as a people, because the whole, at the time of our founding, the whole conversation was, what do we want to be as a people? And that's, we've got to have some of that back in our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Bishop McElroy. Um, I wonder if I could um, try to extrapolate another end of the argument uh, and ask if you could um, comment a little bit on the perspective of somebody like Martin Ronheimer, a Swiss theologian, who has argued that um, the procedural fairness of modern constitutional republics, you're familiar with this, um, can offer an expression of a political common good that is not, that falls short of being authentic or substantive or integral right. 
to use the way that we, um, but nevertheless, that it may be time for the church and her theology to consider the possibility that we find the common good that way. Well, I think certainly that could be a pathway. Procedural justice, you know, whether you come at or through Rawls or whatever, it, it, it is a way to getting toward, that has to be part of what the common good is. It has to be reflecting and obtaining a certain level of procedural justice. One of the problems, though, with that is you get back to where does everybody's starting point lie uh, in terms of procedural justice? And how do we make sure that in society people have, have starting points which allow them each to receive and to benefit in important substantive ways. I, that's always the, the reservation I have. I don't know, did you want to say anything? Um, by, starting points, you would bring up by starting points, you would mean um, a moral or an ethical starting point, or you no. would be referring to social status? Social status, oh, the social status for the most part. That, that is, that is procedural, procedural fairness is an important measure of fairness in society. But it, 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 when it start, uh, uh, I remember when uh, somebody was talking about a, a prominent political figure who was was not Donald Trump. I would say who was who was a, a very wealthy man. They said uh, um, he got a tr uh, he uh, he hit a home run. He was born on third base and thought he got a triple. Um, and so th th that's that's part of the dilemma. The thing. What, the great problem is how do we in society grapple with that question? that if you want to know where people are going to end up, the most fundamental question to ask is, what was the educational attainment of your parents? You know, if you know the answer to that, that'll tell you an awful lot about where you're going to end up. And how do we move to a society where that's less true? Especially with, with, with these indicators of greater inequality occurring in, in society. So. so. I hope you'll continue or consider running for president at some point. Oh, oh no, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, but if not, um, maybe you could comment on, uh, there seems to be, uh, to have evolved a particular way of people worshiping and um, reflecting on uh, the sacraments and practicing the sacraments uh, in a particular way, such as 24-hour um, adoration or other devotional um, type prayer that uh, seems to have somehow developed into a dichotomy against things like the common good. And so there's things like the fortnight for freedom that uh, seem to focus on, on things that seem divisive to the common good. And they seem to be promoted by people that uh, view uh, Catholicism as in a particular way. And the irony is that that same, uh, uh, I'm not wanting to be so categorical, but that's, that same group of people often seem to demonize immigrants, when immigrants themselves often worship in a most devotional way, you know, especially in regard to the Eucharist. And so I'm just wondering if you can comment on kind of the, the way that those things seem to have become mixed up when the Eucharist itself, itself is supposed to um, commission us to go forth to, to fulfill the common good. And that was the point of of the Second Vatican Council and things being in English so that we can understand our mission to go and do all the things that you're talking about. And um, it just seems to be a real fight um, that goes on right now. And it seems to fall into a lot of the categories, sacrament, if you, if you take your categories and kind of transfer them to sacramental um, categories, there seems to be similar infighting. And so I'm just wondering if you can comment on that. On the sacramental part, I, I think it's only somewhat true in this sense. I, I'm Bishop of San Diego. Um, 
I've been there a little less than a year, so the first thing I did was go around visited every parish. Okay. One of the things that pleased me, there's a lot of Eucharistic devotion. Many parishes, I'd say most parishes, have a chapel uh, that's open all the time. The people, you, often the people have a combination to get in there, okay? So, and so Eucharistic prayer is available to people 24-7. It's a really nice thing. There's also what's called perpetual adoration, which is in some places, and that can either be, in my experience, very good or divisive. Not because in, in and of itself, but because sometimes people who are in favor of perpetual adoration will say, if you're not into perpetual adoration, you're not being faithful enough. But at the same time, on the popular pieties, um, in San Diego, for example, on, on Holy Thursday, I uh, washed uh, the feet. I, I was wa washing feet all day. I should have gotten a union card for it. <laughs> I was at the ecumenical uh, service in the morning with the Episcopalians put on washing feet. Then they had one for janitors. The janitors are, are, the, are being treated very poor. Out in front of City Hall, so we did the, the, the janitors. Then, then I was at the cathedral, as you. Um, and so... Uh, Although I had to say, I, I can't wash feet because I can't, my knees are bad. So if I go down, I don't come up. <laughs> so I have to, I, it was really bad. And then when I was at the janitor foot washing, they originally wanted to sit up so I would wash some feet, which I was happy to do when we were able to make that work. Then they wanted somebody, a janitor to wash my feet. I said, oh, well, we're not having that, a picture of that. Could you imagine that going around, you know? <laughs> but at the janitor foot washing, for example, you, you know, the, the, the symbolic signs of faith that were there were very traditional. This is a Hispanic group. Very traditional. So it doesn't, the clash isn't exact, at least as I encounter it in a place like San Diego, is, is quite different from that, from that split. There is the problem in, within uh, the world of Catholic social teaching that people sometimes go on one set of issues and not on the other, and it tends to go with the party divides uh, more often. Uh, so the bishops nationally actually have had a project, uh, kind of a secret project they've been working on now for four years. And I really like it. It's, it's run by a group called the right, I get this wrong, what is the part that's the affective side? Is it the right brain or the left brain? Right brain. Right, right is affective. It's whatever it is, it's, I think it's, so it's the Right Brain Institute did this study and it looked at ca all different types of Catholics. It, it, it did, uh, Bishops, it did, you know, large blocks of lay people, it did different cultural groups, it did priests, it did religious women, it did everybody, young people. On this question, affectively, from the right brain thing, not conceptually, but right brain, how, did, how do you, what, what ways do you do to affectively help people to understand the broad spectrum of, Catholic, of the, what we would call the common good? Um, and they found surprisingly that for over 75% of the people, it was very easy. That the, there was a natural affective tie in there to them. It was about the 12% on either, 12.5% on either end that wouldn't work. But, 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 but the, the surprising thing to me was it was broadly very effective. So they're going to have a report back to us uh, uh, this coming year on how do, we, how do we make use of that to bridge this divide. I went to one, uh, the, the state of Washington took an initiative that I thought was very, very fine. They, uh, <clears throat> I forget what the initiative was called. What they basically did, they wanted to bring together their pro-life groups and their uh, uh, social justice groups. You know how in parishes you often have one committee will be one and one committee will be the other and so forth. <laughs> Well, they wanted to bring the two together. So they did, a th the, the church in Wash the state of Washington, all three dioceses, made a commitment that their project for the next five years was this thing. It was a commitment to children from conception to the age of five. In other words, it linked those two and brought everybody together in the same big meeting and launched them, and the Knights of Columbus was there with the, uh, br bringing equipment, and the Catholic Charities was there, and everybody committed, this is our priority for the next five years in terms of a justice outreach. But it was a way of doing that, of linking those two ways very effectively, because who's going to be against a child? 
So I think there are some creative ways to do that, but we do have to do some bridge building in our own communities um, on the company. With that, I was also going to ask, there seems to also be a thought that all the things that Pope Francis is witnessing are, are kind of his take on the church and that it's against the Catholic Church and he's, you know, corrupting the church. And um, it, it, you know, it, it, it is interesting to me uh, when John Paul II started promoting adoration and perpetual adoration that, you know, everybody seemed to line up, but nobody's lining up to open food shelves and things. But, but in um, John Paul II's encyclical on the Eucharist, he spoke to that at the very end of it in terms of encouraging people to do charity. And again, that did not get any press, you know. And it seems like the justice parts of it seem to be thought of as not real Catholicism, you know. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on that as well. Uh, well, you know, people play things differently in the media on the thing. Uh, and, and, and actually, we all reflect our own faith in different ways, too. We all, we all edit, we're all, in some sad sense, cafeteria Catholics in how we, we live our faith and how we, what we emphasize. But really, if you look at, that, this is why I mentioned like Benedict and the environment. If you want to know who said the real earth-shattering things to the environment, it was, it was Pope Benedict. He was the one who got in there first and really made the key things. If, if you want to read John Paul II, for example, on the dignity of labor, it's powerful. It's very powerful stuff on the rights, on what, what work is. You know, that when we work, we're co-creators and the, what the dignity of the worker is. So I think it's not easy to divide these things in that way. I don't think they fall. I do think each of these popes does, these three ones you mentioned, does something different. That is, Pope John Paul II, I think, um, was, was pointing to a sense of um, resurgence and unity in the life of the church. I think that was his kind of thrust. For Pope Benedict, what it was was the threat of relativism, and thus his emphasis was on truth. For, for Pope Francis, he, he looks on the most important thing, the threat is that of like judgmentalism in the life of the church and not appreciating the mercy of God. So his emphasis, I think, is on the mercy of God. At the same time, saying that, uh, all three of the last popes have pointed to mercy in very powerful ways. John Paul II had the divine mercy, which we just celebrated. That was, if, you, if you'd look, what was the central spiritual contribution of John Paul II, the life of it's mercy. Benedict said, Jesus is the mercy of God. It was, it was one of his most powerful talks. Jesus is the mercy of God. And now you have uh, Francis saying, you know, uh, mercy is at the center of what. So I, I think there's more commonality than sometimes. But there is a difference in emphasis, yes. Uh, Bishop McElroy, I read the article um, when you spoke up at the um, Conference of Bishops about the um, adjustment of faithful citizenship, I think it was, to Pope Francis's goals of uh, seamless garment for the church. And um, I remember reading in the article that only about 40 of the 300 bishops in attendance um, really came to that committee meeting or whatever it was ab about economic justice and social justice, yet we have 90% approval ratings of Francis. And I recall in Argentina, he always um, kept his finger on the pulse of the average parishioner as a way of, of uh, addressing those divides. How can surveying of the of the parish communities, which was done last year for the synod on the family, how can the uh, pulse of the of the parishioner will in this be uh, reflected amongst the American bishops to um, transform the American church as Francis is doing worldwide? Uh, I want to put in the context a little bit the the thing on the vote that took place on that document. What happened was um, there's a process in the bishops' conference for issuing this every four years. This document, Faithful Citizenship, was written in, let's see, what is that, 2008, originally. And, the, and it was crafted to get through. Now, there are different views among bishops. This got through with all but two votes, okay? Uh, there's only two votes against it. 
So it was, they were pleased they got through. So then when they brought it up in 2008, they didn't want to rewrite the whole thing. So they put it through pretty much the same way it is. Now, it wouldn't quite work to do it that way because you have Pope Francis and so forth. So they put in some additional things and some of the additional things of the late Pope Benedict. But a number of us felt it hadn't changed the core of it enough to reflect some of these insights of Pope Francis. So several of us got up. Now, the problem was, it was partly our fault, too. We had no exit strategy in the sense that this, this thing came up for a vote in November. We weren't going to meet again until the next November, and they had to, so that would be right at the time of the election. So either we were going to have no document, which would, they couldn't do, or there was no time to revise this. So the fact that there weren't a lot of votes against it really had more to do with that. I believe a lot more. If, 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 we, had, if we were meeting a few months afterwards for a full assembly, I think we could have gotten a, taken back for revision and they would have integrated. I, I do believe that. At least there would have been a significant number of votes to do that. Um, in terms of how do you involve people, I, I'm going to try an interesting experiment in San Diego. You know, this new apostolic exhortation came out today. And Pope Francis talks about synodality, the idea of trying to use the synodal process at different levels of the church. So I brought it up with our priests and lay leadership. What we're going to do is we're going to have a synod that's specifically on the topic of this apostolic exhortation for two days in October, where there'll be one representative from each parish will meet to, to stroke, partly because it's on marriage and family life, which should be, of all, of all topics, should be involving the laity tremendously. So I'm not sure what's going to come of it, but we're going to try it. And uh, I like experiments, so we'll, we'll let you know what comes of it. Because I've been in parts of many pastoral councils, and those are hard to get right. So we're going to try this method and see if it works. So anyway, that's one way of doing it. Uh, Bishop Bacow, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that you visited all of your parishes and that uh, you found them to be, you know, very uh, in good shape, it sounded like. Um, at the parish level, um, I do the kind of work where I'm aware of many dioceses concerned about the divide between younger and older priests. Um, and obviously it's not everybody on either side of, yeah. of these issues. But um, do you have a, a way of... Um, thinking about how the uh, disruption that occurs when pastors change in a parish that exists in sort of one style, uh, somewhat related to the previous question that came along, when a new pastor comes in and makes a lot of changes and it really causes people to move or leave the church or bad things. I mean, we know so many Catholics are not going to church. Do you have any uh, comments about how you might deal with that? Well, it's an important point um, now, see, when I was trained as a priest, what we were taught was, first of all, you change nothing for a year of anything significance. Because you go and you try to learn why is it the way it is. Now, you may well find the reason for it being the way it is is stupid, but, but, and then you change it. But lots of times you'll find out there's a reason it's the way it is, or, and maybe you don't even agree that much with that reason, but it's not a bad reason, so you go along with it. So I did, I did make the thing that for a year I would make no major changes unless there was some emergency. Uh, <clears throat> I did make one rule, because something you're talking about drove me nuts. Uh, and it was specifically over this ideological question. It was the moving of the tabernacle. <laughs> Pastors would come in and move it either to the center or out of the center, and repeatedly. And so I did say to the priest, I said, there's now a hold on tabernacle. I said, until I retire, no tabernacle is moving anywhere. Where it is, it stays. <laughs> Be well, because to me, it just symbolized in a particular way what you're talking about, but in a way that just the community flares up, no matter which side they're on, you know. So I said, that, that's, we're not going to make this a, a place of division within the life of the community. So we have some one way, some the other. It's not, now, I do have a preference, which I'm not saying, but, <laughs> but, but I just said that all those changes. Are, so, but, but that is, there is just, it goes back to the question of pastoral prudence that really is at the heart of this. And, and partly it's pastoral prudence in assignments by bishops and personnel boards, too. You, you don't send someone into a, the culture of a parish where it's going to uproot the thing, unless there's something terrible there that needs to be uprooted, you know? And so we know enough, you know, uh, that's why I like the personnel board system, because they, they know these guys a lot better than I do. I've just been there a year. 
And so it comes out on the table, you know, what, what, what are the pluses and minuses of this one, that one, and, and a lot of those issues come in. And so sometimes you don't, <laughs> I do remember I was in, what, I, I, this is terrible, I can't tell the story without everybody thinking it's San Francisco, which it is, but I, 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 I won't say what bishop it was then. There was, there was a pastor who we thought should not be made, I was on the personnel board, okay? And uh, we thought should not be made a pastor. He'd been a pastor and it hadn't worked out. And so uh, the, uh, uh, the editor said, well, can't we send this person there? And, and we all thought, no. And then, then the board said, that, he killed the last parish. He said, that'd be just like the, for the parish to open up their door and find the dead fish wrapped in the newspaper on the front doorstep, you know? <laughs> so, so then he said, well, maybe we could send him a place where he had a bad pastor before that they know what it wouldn't be too much of a change for them, you know? <laughs> so uh, that, that's a hard part when you're dealing with that question. But, but basically, the, 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 what you're saying is true, you know? There, at the same time, I have to say this, I got a really good letter, really good letter from the head of a finance committee in a parish in our diocese. And uh, a priest has been sent there and he has his pluses and his minuses, okay? And the, they've had a history there and some people are upset. A few really like him, a significant number don't. Most people are okay with him, but a significant number aren't. So, so this very thoughtful finance cancer member wrote in, chair wrote in, and he said, you know, I just want to let you know my perspective. It was a very balanced perspective. It, it, it I think, caught it exactly right. And then he said, I don't know what we're supposed to do in a case like this. He said, you know, is it that the pastor should conform to what the parishioners, make himself into what the parishioners want, or is it what the parishioners need to make themselves conform to what the pastor wants or can do? Or is it something in the, in the middle? I tend to think it's something in the middle. I think he's right. It was a very thoughtful letter. But sometimes there's that that goes on too. But it's not, it's not easy. Uh, the common good. You gave various examples through popes, etc. Is the term itself originally uh, a religious term? Is it originally a governmental term? What well, well, what does it go back to? Um, it's a philosophical term, but I don't know the exact origin of it. Does anybody hmm. hear? It's a philosophical oh, term. Okay. It's, not a, it's not a theological term per se, although it's embedded in Catholic theology for a long time. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a philosophical term, but I don't remember okay. if it's where, do you know, Kristen? So it, it goes back to Plato and Aristotle, possibly? Yeah, I did it up on that too. Okay, thank you. So then, just number two, is there going to be a document on faithful citizenship, or is there not going to be there a document? There is one. It is. It's done. It's already packed. It's on the website. If you want it, it's there. It is? Yeah. Okay, it's on thank the, you. On the, the new one is there. I voted no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bishop. I wonder if you could speak to um, the consistent ethic of life and <clears throat> where, where it is uh, these days um, and what its future might be. Obviously, uh, Cardinal Bernadine was personally responsible for its promulgation and its the energy behind it. Yeah. Uh, he died, in, and for other, other reasons, it, it sort of was changed, kind of went to the back burner, if maybe even off the stovetop altogether. Um, is there a future for it? Uh, is is it open to development? Uh, sure. I heard, I heard a talk within the last two years by Cardinal Mueller, who's the head of the Congregation of the Doctor of the Faith, on where we can go with, with the uh, consistent ethic of life and the use of the seamless garment image. Now, it's different than Bernadine was using it, uh, but not that much different. So the, what, what my read of what happened on it was this. Cardinal Bernadine was talking from a particular perspective. It, it, the talk started out, why is it that the bishops of the United States alone, virtually alone, find themselves in the position where they have major opposition to abortion and major opposition to nuclear war? Because this was at the time they're writing the letters on war and peace. 
And it's from that question, he says, why do we stand in such an odd place in our society that virtually no one's with us on these two questions, that he develops this theme of the seamless garment and the consistent ethic of life. So in that reflection, I think it's absolutely valid Catholic theology that he, the, 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 the objection to it, I think, came from those who said, even though these are all necessary positions for us to have, there are some that are more important, than, more grave evils than others. That they, they, they were saying just, it's true, it's part of a seamless garment, but certain, certain threads are graver than other threads. And I myself would agree with that. They're, they're, you know, uh, uh, where people who were, uh, had objections that I think are not well found in Catholic theology, they, were, they used it to divide the seamless garment. It's the, you know, the five essential issues are this, that, and the other, and then all these others are just prudential questions up for grabs. I think that's not a legitimate use of Catholic theology. But, but the, the seamless garment is, to me, is still, uh, as I say, Cardinal Muller used it as of two years ago, and it, it starts out, yes, we do have a consistent ethic of life. Do you think, in terms of its future in the American Episcopate, does it require a strong spokesperson like Bernadine in order for it to continue or, or not? My own hope is that uh, I think it comes now with such baggage that it would be hard to use that as the as the framework, you know what I mean? Not because there's anything wrong with the framework, because it carries certain, where did you stand or where do you stand on this, a whole, on a whole range of issues. That's why I'm hopeful about this right brain thing, which does, the right brain is the same sort of thing. It just says, how do we achieve that breadth of issues which are consistent with Catholic teaching and help bring them to our people on, on ways where they get it uh, uh, so that there is, in a sense, a Catholic political imagination where you say, oh yeah, this all fits. So I, I think, I'm hopeful that that might be an opportunity for it. I'm trying to defer to the president. <laughs> <laughs> um, on this same topic, um, I wonder if you could talk about how you see the political polarization. So if we had the Right Brain Institute convince not only Catholics of the integrity of this, um, the interrelatedness of the issues, so maybe drop the baggage framework, but you brought out kind of the interrelatedness of educational attainment and economics or race and crime. Do you think um, politicians today Catholic or otherwise, um, can't see whether red state or blue state kind of a purple agenda or just can't the way uh, politics is funded or the way parties are polarized? Like why can't a, for instance, anti-abortion Democrat move the party uh, into these more moderate nuanced positions? Like what's your take, not just theoretically, but practically? I think it's become so, everybody's gone to their base. I feel that the, 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 the great problem in my view is now, candidates are more afraid of losing their primary than they are of losing their general election. Yeah. Thus they have to always look, if they're a Democrat, they have to look off to their left for an attack. If they're a Republican, they have to look off to their right. So they can't let anyone get around them in that way. So I think that's a huge impediment to, to uh, to go where you are. But I, at the same time, I think there are solutions of some of these things. I was at a meeting, for, for example, uh, uh, the, the Catholic Conference of Bishops and the Evangelicals, uh, the, the Baptists specifically, made a um, concerted effort. Remember at the time of, what was that? The, uh, it was not the impoundment. At the time of the, the budget, the sequester. The sequester that came from that budget. At the time, we made a coalition with the evangelicals to block cutting of domestic poverty funds as part of the sequester. Now, there have been some various cuts over time, but, uh, and the evangelicals were really strong with us on that. Uh, so we were able to do it. The one thing we weren't able to get out of that was the 
uh, unbelievably, the foreign policy. You know, uh, the, the global cuts go really easy because nobody cares. There's no constituency for, for the global poor, none. But, but what was so interesting when we were in the middle of that was you could get everyone agreed to help in, in terms of helping poor. Conservatives, moderates, independents, their economic planners, everybody earned income tax credit. That was the way they will all, all sign on. Everybody was on board on that. And so there are certain pathways that everybody's for because they know it works. So I do think there's some potential there, uh, even if there's not political progress. I guess my question was very similar in the sense we all have become part of political conversations these days because everyone, wherever they are on the spectrum, is finding that there's no choice that sufficiently meets their philosophy. And, you know, I was in a conversation yesterday, well, so what are we left to do as individual voters uh, to somehow bring this country and this discussion more back to some common basis of the common good? I mean, we just, we can pick between the fringes, but no one wants to pick between the fringes. I think part of it will depend on what the outcome is here in the sense that uh, if Donald Trump is the nominee, I would guess there's a very fractured Republican Party in it, the wake of that campaign. So then there'll be some realignment within the Republican Party. That's an opportunity for people to contribute to the refashioning of some of the Republican agenda to make it more conducive, a broader sense of the common good. Um, uh, but uh, but it's going to be a wild ride, I think, until then. So I think this is no short-term answer, and I'm praying there's a long-term answer. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I think that there's long there is a long-term answer. Yeah. I asked this question knowing that there are students here thinking about the meaning of the term common good. And in your talk, you made reference to a meeting uh, where there was a focus on the global common good. And, and you've been intentionally talking in terms of the international common good. Could you comment on the differences in the use of the term or your choice of the sure. use of the term? Sure. The common good is the notion, um, everybody is familiar with what their individual good is, okay? My, my, what is to my own well-being? Okay. one might call rational self-interest, although that has a political uh, and an economic orientation now that I'm not so comfortable with. But that the, the individual uh, framework is one way of framing it. The other framework is this. We all belong to different societies. And in this view, every, every group you belong to is a society. Your family, for example, that's a society. Okay. And um, uh, there's a term uh, uh, Michael Walzer used years ago, although he used it in a different way. Um, uh, was it, was it not webs of justice. Spheres. Spheres of justice. But I think it captures this well. He used it in a different way, in a very specific way. But uh, it was spheres of justice. And, and I say it in this way. Let me ask some of you who are students here, OK? If, um, if I came to you now, I'll come down and uh, ask you, um, I tell you that I uh, am out of a job. I'm no longer a bishop, I've lost my job. And I'm in need of a job, and I have a good business plan here, and I only need to borrow $5,000 from you. And you have 5000 and it won't hurt you to give it to me. Do you have an obligation to give it to me? Who would say yes? Are you students? Okay, what would you say? No. What would you say if I were your father and had raised you and sacrificed for you? Yeah. Okay, and the difference is we have a web, a sphere of justice that requires something different of me. And the, the notion of the common good means in every society we belong to, there's certain obligations to the good of the whole that go beyond our own good that we are obliged to by reason of belonging to that society, in this case, belonging to your family. 
But it's the same way, you know, in the city you belong to or the state you belong to, the nation we belong to. And what the, what the, the, the national common good was the, uh, you know, the highest common good, basically, for most of human history. But the argument now is there's, because we live in a globalized world, there's an international common good. And really, Catholicism does say that to us, partly because Catholicism is so big on saying we're all part of the human family. Who are we? You know, oftentimes we'll say, well, we're Americans. And that's true. That's part of the common good we owe is to our nation as a whole. Part of identity is we're Americans. And we owe things to Amer other Americans we don't owe to others. But part of it is we are uh, children of the one God who's the father of us all. And thus the common good of the world as a whole demands certain things of us that we treat people with certain minimums. And the, the, the great problem here is how do you integrate that? How, how do you bring that into our conception of the common good nationally? When foreign policy comes up, now there's certain things of, how would, what would you say motivates our foreign policy? In, in, a, in, a, not, in a, not in a negative sense, in a sense of how do we understand our, for, what, are, what are our objectives in foreign policy? What would you say? Security is one, yes. Trade, peace, what? Human development, human development. an altruistic one. Well, peace is pretty altruistic, but peace helps us. Human. The notion of the com international common good has this notion of altruism to it. It means that we as a nation don't look to what is just in our national interest, the United States, but what has to be integrated in that some sense into it is our foreign policy decision making also has to take into account the good of the whole, okay? In other words, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> um, certain trading policies we have. In the United States, we produce cotton. Our cotton is relatively expensive to certain other countries. So what do we do? What do we do to help our cotton trade? Yeah. Tariffs, we have tariffs on cotton. Do you know where else they can grow cotton effectively? Parts of sub-Saharan Africa. But with the, with the tariff, they can't. So it's that sort of thing where the, what, what, what the international common good says, you, you've got to look at that. In the one area where this very poor region of the world can, can do exactly what you want them to do, can help become more self-sufficient. It's morally wrong to cripple them in this way. It's just things like that. Looking at the structures of how the trading system set, the financial systems, all that. Amer America has done things that uh, have been quite generous at times. And at times, we have integrated that into our foreign policy. The Marshall Plan after World War II. When Europe was destroyed after World War II, I don't think this could happen today. I really don't think it could happen today. Uh, what happened was Europe was devastated in, in ruins. And the Secretary of State, George Marshall, at Harvard Convention got up and announced a plan. We're going to America, because America at that time had 50% of the world's production after World War II, because the other countries have been so, so devastated. We're going to just give money, tons of money, and loan tons more to Europe to help them recover. Everybody thought it was, well, I mean, not everybody thought it was good, but everybody went along. I don't think that could happen today, but that's part of what the international common good is, that we, that we belong to the world, and particularly in this area like the environment, or in armaments, or those sorts of things. You know, drugs are where we see it a lot, too. The drug thing is such a difficult, I don't have any even sense of direction on that. But thank you all very much, and uh, great being here. I also.